Huh. We're in a series where we're talking about things that are difficult. There's a lot of difficult things to talk about in this world and in our life. And we've been trying to tackle some of those issues from a scriptural standpoint, uh, from a loving and compassionate standpoint, but we're trying to not glaze over the difficult things that we deal with uh, in this world and in our society and, and those types of things. So we started with the isms, that, that in Christ there are no isms, there's no racism, there's no nationalism, there's no sexism, we are all one in Christ, equal in value, equal in worth, thank God for his grace and for that. And then we went to addiction and we talked about the difficulties of that. And then last week we talked about uh, generosity and the importance of being a generous Christian, that, a, that if you say you are a follower of Jesus, then those around you should consider you a generous person. And if they do not, you have something you need to be praying about and working upon because the Lord calls us to be generous. And I don't just mean tithing to the church, which I never even actually said last week that you should tithe to the church because that's how fundamental it is. I wasn't talking about being generous by giving your tithe. That's a settled issue. We should be giving to the church, period. That was for free today. Wasn't going to say that, but there it came. Today we're talking about courage. We'll be in 1 Kings. It's a cool little story. Uh, the first time I really noticed, if I'm being honest, really noticed these scriptures uh, was, was a book that I read by Mark Batterson several years ago. Um, today's message is not based on that book, but um, it, it's when it really jumped out to me, and it's a, it's a kind of a neat thing. Um, so, you know, anytime you're, you're, you're those, those first 12 books of Scripture in the Old Testament are, are historical books. They're narratives. They're telling the story. Uh, a lot of the books in the Old Testament aren't telling the story, but those 12 books are. They're, they're historical, documented events, and so I like to try to give us things to wrap our hands around to, uh, con you know, context for where we are. So let's talk about that real quick, where we are, where we're picking up this story today as far as historical events take place, as far as historically speaking, I mean. So this is taking place about 1,000 B.C. Anytime you're talking about David, Solomon, Saul, well, let me say that in the correct order, Saul, David, Solomon, the first three kings of Israel, you're about 1,000 B.C., give or take a a couple of decades, but that's an easy way to remember it. So more accurately, it's about 970 BC when this is taking place. So it's about 3,000 years ago. Israel, the nation of people, have been living uh, under the rule as a, unified, as a unified nation under King David for 33 years where we're picking it up here today. David has enjoyed much success. He's expanded the kingdom, conquered lands, conquered enemies. He's lived righteously and done a great job as king, except for one little, just one little mistake that David made where he coveted Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, one of David's best friends, one of his best soldiers, slept with her, impregnated her, tried to cover up the pregnancy by getting Uriah to come home and sleep with her. He wouldn't do it because he was actually a righteous man, and that didn't work out, so he ultimately had him killed in battle accidentally, basically being responsible for his murder so that he could take Bathsheba in and be the hero and pretend like that's when the pregnation happened. One little mistake. No big deal. The reason I bring that up, not just for fun, because it's whatever, this matters for today's events, because the two men that are trying to become king as David is in his last days are his sons, Adonijah and his son Solomon. Solomon's mother is Bathsheba, the same Bathsheba that, that I just joked about. Yes, that Bathsheba. That is the mother of Solomon. So David's terrible mistakes, while forgiven by the Lord, because somehow this gracious king of ours continues to forgive us in our obsolent ways against him. He's forgiven. When he repented, he was forgiven of this, uh, but it has gone on to cause massive national consequences on him and on God's people because that's what sin does. It causes consequences in our actual real lives here and now. So David's son, Adonijah, is in the process of securing the coronation of becoming the next king. He wants to be the next king. And he's throwing what he plans to, be, to, 
to be a king's coronation party. He's invited guests. He's got them coming over. Uh, and he wants this to turn into a coronation party so he can become the king in front of the people and, and be the next king, not his half-brother Solomon. Does, he doesn't invite some really key people like the, Nathan the prophet, the prophet, Solomon his half-brother. He doesn't invite him. Uh, he doesn't invite David, his father, the current king. You know, so I mean, this is real on the up and up. Nevertheless, he's trying to unify support so that he can become king and make it happen on his own. David receives news that this is taking place, that his, one of his sons is trying to secretly become the next king. He receives this news from Nathan the prophet, and he realizes that he can no longer stall in his responsibilities to anoint the next king. David has been stalling. He knows who it should be. He knows that he's supposed to do it, but he hasn't done it. Why? Because it was going to be hard. For many reasons, he didn't, he didn't do it yet. For one, he's having to pick one son over the other. For two, whichever son he picks, the one he picks is likely to kill the other one because the other one's going to be coming for his throne. It's not an easy situation David is in, but this kind of forces him to make that decision because Adonijah is trying to make it happen on his own. So that's the context. That's the setting of where we're picking this up today. A lot going on. So it's easy to miss how important this is as we dig into it. So... In those verses, King David then said, he's just received this news, call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, for me. So they came into the king's presence. The king said to them, take my servants with you, have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and take him to Gihon. There Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet are to anoint him as king over Israel. You are to blow the ram's horn and say, long live King Solomon. You are to come up after him, and he is to come in and sit on my throne. He, he is the one who is to become king in my place. He is the one I have commanded to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Amen. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, replied to the king, may the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, so affirm it. May the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, so affirm it. Just as the Lord was with my Lord, the king, so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So at one of the most critical moments in David's life, and definitely one of the most critical moments for the nation of Israel, David decides, okay, Call the guys together. It's time to make this official and pass on my crown for me to Solomon. He needs the right people, the critical people for this plan to, to happen and to happen correctly. And he tells them, take my servants and get my son Solomon and ride him down on a mule to Gihon. Gihon is an ancient spring down in the valley just outside of Jerusalem. It's a critical water source for Jerusalem. It's an important place for an important event. That's what we do. We do important things at important places. It says, take him there and anoint him as king and blow the ram's horn, which is to announce victory. If you didn't know when the horn is blown. Announce victory with the ram's horn and have everyone pro proclaim, long live King Solomon. Sit him on my throne. He's the rightful king. He's the one God chose. He's the one I choose. He is the ruler over Israel and Judah. Like I promised his mother before the Lord, before the Lord, he promised Bathsheba that Solomon would be the next king. Don't you know she was holding his feet to the fire on that one, as she should have? He is king, David says. So again, for the most absolute critical mission that could not fail, David calls his guys together and tells them this plan. He calls Zadok the priest. That makes sense. He calls Nathan the prophet. Okay, I'm still with him. That makes sense. And he calls Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. Really weird name and way to refer to someone. Who is this guy? He calls three guys together. Who is this guy? These three guys along with the Cherethites and the Pelethites. There's you some good Old Testament words. 
who are the king's bodyguards. That's who those two groups of people are. He says, go with Solomon and a throng of people down to the Gihon, Gihon in the valley with Solomon, riding on the donkey. Notice how that is a theme for a king. How that just keeps coming back up. It's almost like Jesus is all over Scripture, not just in the New Testament. Those of you that don't know what that is, it, maybe it'll catch up to you later on. And they are down at Gihon, and then we pick it back up. Verse 39. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the ram's horn, and all the people proclaimed, Long live King Solomon! All the people followed him, playing flutes and rejoicing with such a great joy that the earth split open from the sound. What a scene. Picture it. Earthquake from a celebration like it does in Seattle when they, when they score a big touchdown. Right? Sets off the seismic monitors. Earthquaking celebration for the people that are rightly following Solomon. They're celebrating. This has been a big deal. It's finally happening. They're excited about it. Now, Adonijah and all the guests at his party hear the ruckus. They're in the city of Jerusalem. It's not that far from them. They hear this taking place. They hear the horn. What is going on? They're thinking. Then Abiathar, the priest's son, Jonathan, shows up and tells them what's going on. And he says in verse 43, you can continue with me, our Lord King David has made Solomon king. Now remember, they're in the middle of a party that's supposed to end up being a coronation party for Adonijah to become the king. This would be what we would call uh, defeating news for Adonijah. And with Solomon the king has sent Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benanoia, son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they have made him ride on the king's mule, which was a sign of royalty. That's why Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. I'll go ahead and solve that mystery for you if you didn't catch that earlier. Verse 45, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon. Jonathan is telling them. They've, they've gone from there rejoicing. The town has been in an uproar. That's the noise you heard. Solomon has even taken his seat on the royal throne. Jonathan is sharing this news with Adonijah and all of his guests. The king's servants have also gone to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, may your God make the name of Solomon more well known than your name, and may he make his throne greater than your throne. Then the king bowed in worship on his bed, and the king went on to say this, may the Lord God of Israel be praised. Today he has provided one to sit on my throne, and I am a witness. So, Jonathan tells all of these people that. Now, we live in a fairly civilized society, fairly, and so we don't understand the gravity of news like that sometimes. When, when thrones changed, when kings changed, and someone different sat on the throne, those who opposed him becoming king are now the enemy. Not the enemy like we think of enemies, where we talk bad about them behind their back, or post passive aggressive stuff about them on social media. Enemies like, now you have to die. That kind of enemy. So now all of Adonijah's guests are trembling and they're scared because they back the wrong dude and they know it. So they scatter. Kind of like what happened. Have you ever seen a schoolyard fight? When uh, I'm chase that rabbit. And then, the, and then the coach comes around the corner and just scatter. So Adonijah is scared. Now, and he should be. He should be scared. Word gives to Solomon that he is scared. And King Solomon says, hey, if he acts right, he's good. If he doesn't, then he can catch these hands. That's my translation. But he says he's going to take him out. So David, after this has happened, David dies. He was on his la in his last days when he was, this was ta taking place. So David dies, and he gives Solomon his last instructions and last advice. A dying father telling his son, the new king, what he needs to do and what's going on. He tells them, hey, there's going to be some guys that got to go. I swore I wouldn't kill a couple of these dudes to the Lord, but they need to die. 
What they did deserves death for their transgressions. They aren't to be trusted. They will betray you when the time is right. So take care of them when the time is right. So now Adonijah, in his arrogance and foolishness and pride, which proves he wasn't supposed to be the next king, what he does next, tries to pull a stunt. Long story short, as preachers always say and then lie, long story short, he comes up to Solomon's mom, Bathsheba, and makes a request. He says, hey, ask Solomon to let me have Abishag, the Shunammite, to be given to me as a wife, which we read over when we just read these types of things as in our daily readings and don't think about the context and don't think about where we're at or anything else. <laughs> and I'd take that, honestly. Half of us aren't even doing that. Whew, I'm chasing rabbits already. But we can read that and not catch the, 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 the gravity of what's being said here. What, why is that a big deal that Adonijah asked this? Well, because in those times when the next king took over, it was customary for him to take a wife of the previous king. They had multiple wives and concubines then, which were ser servant wives, basically. And you were supposed to take one as your own. Kind of like saying, what was his is now mine. Well, Abishag is one of David's concubines. She was part of his harem, which is the, the word for the wives and the concubines and the female relatives and the servants that all lived in the house with the king. It says David was never intimate with her, which is kind of key, but that she was part of his harem. So in the people's eyes, even though they didn't know that David and her hadn't slept together, the people's eyes considered her a concubine, a wife, a servant wife of David's, an exceptionally beautiful one, as it were. So it would have been noticed had this, take had this take place. It, would, it wouldn't have been a noticeable thing. And according to C.H. Keel in the Books of the Kings commentary, taking possession of the harem of a deceased king was equi equivalent to a, an establishment of the claim to the throne. Adonijah is still trying to be the king. That's what's taking place here. So Bathsheba says, sure, I'll go tell him. She agrees to ask Solomon on Adonijah's behalf to make this happen. Now the text is absolutely silent, and this is a complete side note, just for a second. The text is absolutely silent on whether Bathsheba was naive, the mother of Solomon, and thought this was just an innocent interest in love, and so she just shared it with Solomon, or maybe being a wise woman, she knew this would be the information Solomon needed, to push him to do what needed to be done. Because Solomon was sure gonna know what Adonijah was trying to do. I don't think Bathsheba was stupid. I think she knew exactly what she was doing. I'll go tell my son this, and it's gonna make him so mad that you're gonna die, is what she's thinking. She's trying to protect her son, that's my point, in case you're not keeping up. You can decide for yourself. I don't know why, why Bathsheba did it. it. It doesn't matter to what we're doing, talking about today, but it is interesting. The word of God is interesting. Either way, Solomon, upon hearing Adonijah's request, instantly recognizes it for what it is. It's a grab at the throne again, another time he's trying to do this. And we continue. King Solomon answered his mother, why are you requesting Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Since he is my older brother, you might as well ask the kingship for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab, son of Zariah, who was the leader of the army. Notice he groups all three of these guys together in this action as they have all been together in cahoots vying for the crown, vying for the power, vying for the wealth. They're all trying to do this together and Solomon knows that and he groups them all together even though she only said the one guy's name. Verse 23, then Solomon took an oath by the Lord, which was a big deal. May God punish me and do so severely if Adonijah has not made this request at the cost of his life. In other words, if I don't have Adonijah killed, may God punish me for not doing what needs to be done. And now, as the Lord lives, the one who established me, seated me on the throne of my father David, and made me a dynasty as he promised, I swear Adonijah will be put to death today. Now, who do you think Solomon would ask to complete such an important task? 
Some of you are already ahead of me. Who do you think it would be? Verse 25. Then King Solomon gave the order to Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, who struck down Adonijah, and he died. There's that guy again. Who is this guy? Solomon then goes on and banishes Abiathar the priest, who has helped Adonijah in this attempted coup for the crown. It's a merciful act by Solomon because he, he had done things that were treasonous and deserving of death. He would have been justified legally in executing Abiathar as well, but he doesn't. And then he turns to the final problem. There was three guys. The one that his father in his final instructions, his father David told him, you're going to have to take care of this guy. I said I, couldn't, I, said I wouldn't kill him, but he's going he's gonna to be a problem for you. He's going to try to kill you or take your crown or whatever. Joab, the commander of the king's army, who was a first class slime ball, if you read through the history of Israel. Continuing, verse 29. It was reported to King Solomon, Joab has fled to the Lord's tabernacle and is now beside the altar. Time to take care of this murdering coward, coward of a traitor. Solomon is taking and it's reported to him that he's gone and hid. Who do you think Solomon is going to send to take care of this most heinous dude? <gasps> You're catching on. Some, 17 of you are awake out of the 170 that are here today. It's cool. Then Solomon sent Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, and told him, go and strike him down in 1 Kings 2.29. And after some back and forth, some back and forth takes place. You go to verse 34. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, went up, struck down Joab, put him to death. He was buried at his house in the wilderness. Then the king appointed Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, in Joab's place over the army. And he appointed Zadok the priest in Abiathar's place. And again, I ask, who is this guy? David counts on him to protect the coronation of his son Solomon as king. Solomon counts on him to firmly establish his throne and to execute justice on some bad dudes single-handedly. He asks him to do this. I mean, Joab, guys, Joab was the leader of the king's army under David and still was up to the point that he was executed by Benaiah. You don't become the leader of the army, especially in those days, without being a bad dude. Somebody that can handle themselves. So, someone that can, that can swing a sword, that can throw a punch, that can chunk a spear. You gotta be a warrior to be the king's leader of the army. And Benaniah, son of Jehoiah, is sent by himself to take care of this dude. And does so without much fanfare. Nothing, he just goes in the house, kills him. It's over. Pfft. No extra story there. It's just done. Who is this dude, I ask? Well, 1 Chronicles 27.5 tells us that Benaniah was born to serve as a priest. Interesting. Several priests in Old Testament scripture become prophets, but Benaniah is the only priest who becomes a soldier, a warrior. 2 Samuel 8.18 is the first time he's mentioned, and it tells us that he is in charge of the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Those two groups, I've already told you, are the official bodyguard of the king. They're like the secret service. They're bad dudes. And he was the commander of the body of bad dudes that would take care of the king. He's the head bodyguard for the king. So let's go real quick to this little description of Benaniah, and I think it will clearly we'll clearly see why he was the guy the king was ready to call on when it mattered most and things seemed harder than hard. If you go to 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verse 20, it says this about him in a long description of a lot of things. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Kabzeel, a man of many exploits, his father was. Benaniah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also killed an Egyptian, a huge man. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went down to him with a club, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and then killed him with his own spear. Verse 22, these were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, who had a reputation among the three warriors, the three main dudes. He was the most honored of the 30, like the secret service, but he did not become one of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. The, 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 they're like the Navy SEALs, sorry. The 30 are like the Navy SEALs. 
Instead of making him a Navy SEAL, he makes him a head bodyguard. Okay. Did you catch that? And he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. No other explanation, no other context, no other commentary, just that. I guess the story speaks for itself. It does to me. Think about this. When you hear about a story of a man and a lion and a chase and something dying, what order do you put those events in? If you were to hear that story, every single time there is a lion and a man and a chase and a death, what is the order that you picture that taking place in? Not Benaniah. Whatever you were just picturing is not Benaniah. He went into the pit. He didn't have to go into the pit. He went into the pit. He chased the lion. He went after the lion. But not just went after him. He went after him in a pit. What does that mean? It means no escape once he committed to this. No escape for him, no escape for the lion. What do you picture a lion that is backed into a corner with nowhere to go reacting to? How do you picture this guy, this lion reacting to a man dropping down into a pit with him? Can, can you hear the lion roar? Can you smell the sweat and the fear that you would have had <laughs> and I would have had? Probably some urine, some other stuff. I don't know. No telling. Can you picture it? Woo! I mean, like my adrenaline, uh, give me two claps and a Ric Flair. Woo! It gets me fired up. Like, there's a lot going on here in these little, this little verse. And we just read over it like, oh, it's God's word. It's so boring. I have to read it because he makes me. <sighs> yeah. And if that isn't enough, it's a snowy day. The dude went into a pit after a lion on a snowy day and killed the lion. F.W. Borum says, Benaniah met the worst of enemies, a lion, in the worst of places, a pit, under the worst conditions on a snowy day, and he won. This dude is courage on steroids, times a million to infinity, is who Benaniah is. His Reputation precedes him to the men that are in power and in charge and these types of things. I'd say, or you might say, excuse me, after reading that and thinking for a second, you say courage, I say stupid. Or at least foolish. And I say that there is a very thin line between courage and crazy. It's stupid and foolish and crazy until it works, until you're one. You might have thought I was stupid and foolish and crazy if you'd have seen us hanging these TVs this week. It was quite the operation, but as Jessica said so beautifully, it was a sketchy plan executed to perfection. <laughs> I said, that's my favorite kind. <laughs> I mean... When at the end of it, you're standing and the lion is dead, what are you going to say to that guy? That's what I thought. You wouldn't say nothing to that guy besides good job. And then that's not it. He also killed an Egyptian. And scripture makes sure you understand. A huge man, a giant would be the right word. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went to him with a club, spear club, okay? Snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and then killed him with his own spear. Dude is awesome. <laughs> How do you not love this guy? Put him on a poster, like literally put him on a poster and put him on your wall. He's doing stuff The Rock does in movies except he's doing it for real. What's my point? So no, some of y'all are thinking, <laughs> What are we talking about today? Here's my point. Where are the courageous men and women of God today? We don't have to just read about them. We're still called to be those people. 
probably not fighting a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Most likely that's not going to be the case. But some of the things we face feel just as scary. I thought it, I thought it would get quiet then. Hey, I'm preaching to myself. I get scared too. 1 Corinthians 16, in case you thought this was just an Old Testament thing, be alert, stand firm in the faith. Act like a man. Be strong. Your every action must be done with love. You can't leave that verse off. Or you think you're getting licensed to be a jerk. You're not. Be alert and ready. When, New when the New Testament talks about being alert, most of the time it's in the context of the king is coming back. He's coming. Be alert. Live like he's coming any time now. Live like he's coming any time now. Stand firm in the faith. Don't waver in what we know to be true and right. Don't fall for false teaching, as Paul is constantly having to preach against and teach against. He's just reminded them of the, of the true gospel in the previous chapter here where we picked up in 1 Corinthians. He's just reminded them of that, and he said, I've passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive. Go ask about it. Go ask them if it happened. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, one abnormally born. He also appeared to me, Paul talking about himself because he became an apostle in a strange way. This is the truth, church, that I'm willing to die for. This is the truth that maybe more importantly, we should be willing to live for. Act like a man, be strong, have a backbone, stand on your convictions, don't waver or water down truth. Just make sure that is expressed and served in love. Say, well, stop yelling then. Okay, I'll calm down. Here are some things that I'm convinced are truths that I should stand on. I believe God created human beings in his image. He created them male and female. I believe that male and female are equal in value and equal in worth and different in roles and different in abilities. I also believe that we live in a sinful, fallen world in which there are biological disorders and deformities. So yes, people may struggle psychologically with things like gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder and other conditions. Of course those things exist and are real. Does that mean that I think there are a hundred different genders? No. It, it means Someone may feel like or think that there is. Legitimately may feel like or think that that is true. But just because someone feels like something or thinks something is so does not make it so. I believe people should be loved and cared for and told the truth regardless of any condition they do or do not live in or with in this lifetime. I think truth matters. Truth in love matters. I believe children ought to be protected and cared for by adults. Here's what the psalmist says in, in Psalm 138, 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. That's God the Father talking to us as his children. Then what should we be doing for our children? That that's what God the Father will do for his children. Children ought to be brought up in the instruction of the Lord. They are to be guarded and they are to be protected. Guarded and protected from those who seek to do them harm. And from themselves. Because children are not ready to make adult decisions. That's why there's a difference. That's why we say we have children and we have adults. Now granted, some people who are of age of being adults act like children. I'm not saying it's an age thing, but they must be protected from themselves. They're not ready to make adult decisions until they are adults. Protected from a society that tells them, just follow your heart and do what makes you happy. Well, the same thing that made you happy yesterday will make you cry today. You don't know. Seek the Lord. Seek what he is calling you to do with your life. What I... 
Here's what I'm saying. To me, children are off limits when it comes to anything sexually related. Period. And I'm tired of it. Full stop. End of sentence. This is a hill that I am more than willing to die on. I'm not sitting back and letting an evil, devious, sinful, Satan-led world try to normalize the sexualization of children while we stand here and act like it's not happening. Because it is. It's not okay. And I'm not staying quiet about it. And I really, truly don't care what that costs me to stand up for that. I truly don't. Here's something else I believe. I believe that prosperity is the number one danger in the American church. For the most part, most of us have all the food we need, all the clothes we need, all the shelter we need. So much so that it's easy for us to forget how much we need God and his people in our lives. We say church and worshiping God is a priority in our lives. But our lives say something different. Church and worshiping God is a priority unless it gets in the way for the weekend, unless there is a ball game, unless there is a trip and a trip and another trip and another trip, unless they don't do it the way I don't want them to do it, unless I don't feel 100%, unless I'm just too tired from living my absolute crazy lifestyle and schedule that I could change and not be worn out, but I'm not going to change because deep down I care more about the worldly benefits of my crazy schedule than I do what God thinks about my life. I should be more in tune with the Lord and fellowshipping with his people, but I don't want to slow down. I'll just sleep in and lay around on Sunday and get ready for the week because that stuff's more important to me. I mean, I'll catch the sermon later isn't that the same, right? Prosperity. Having more than we need. It's a blessing, but it comes with dangers. We talked about that some last week when we discussing generosity and being a sacrificial giver to the Lord. Deuteronomy 8, the Lord reminds us, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. Be careful what prosperity brings. We sit around and complain about how far society has fallen from God. Meanwhile, are we in the Word in our homes? Are we in the Word with our families? Are we in prayer in our homes? Are we in prayer with our families? Well, the country went to the dogs when they took prayer out of the school. When's the last time you prayed in your home? Did they take that out? Or did we? I'm asking, where are the courageous men and women of God today? Where are the Benaniahs that will spiritually go into a pit after a lion on a snowy day? Because apparently that lion needed to die. I don't know what he did. I bet he did something. You don't do that otherwise. He didn't do it just for fun. That, that would be stupid. There's part of me that thinks, you know, if there was a giant that needed to be slayed, like David and Goliath, if there was a giant that needed to be slayed today, would any of us be available to do it? I mean... God, I would go chunk a rocket, Goliath, but the Razorbacks are on. Lord, can you wait till after the game? Listen, I watched the game last night too, okay? So I'm not bagging on anybody. Calm down. I mean, God, I'd go chunk a rocket, Goliath, but I'm too busy making memories, Lord, and that's important. I mean, God, I would, I would go stand up and defend that child that has no one in his life, but Lord, I'm just too busy. So many important things I have to get to. I mean, God, I would really consider being a foster parent. I mean, I have the time, I have the space, I have the money, I have every single opportunity in the world to make a difference for a child that has no one in their lives. But God, 
Deep down, really, I'm scared. I'm scared it's going to be too big of an inconvenience for me, Lord, even though you've given me every tool possible to make this happen. But if we just started praying in the schools again, everything would be fine. Everything would be fixed. I mean, God, I would go to that person and admit that I was wrong all those years ago and, I'm, and say that I'm sorry. But God, that's scary. What if they reject my apology? What if, what if, what if? I mean, God, I would, but it's dangerous. I mean, God, I would, but it doesn't make any sense. I mean, God, I would, but what would they say about me, God? I mean, I would, God, but what if I lose my job? I mean, God, I would, but it's just really, it's just really going to be uncomfortable, God. I mean, God, I would, but courage. That's what we need in the American church today. That verse right there. Be alert, standing firm in our faith, living like we believe that Jesus could come back at any minute. And I don't know if you saw the news today, but it could be any minute. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Living like that, like we believe that, being strong, being courageous, making sure every action is done in love, not in condemnation. We don't condemn. You're not condemned. Those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He took it all already. But he did call us to tell the truth. He did. And we need to start living and standing up for the truth like it matters even though it may cost us something. That's why one of our words is sacrifice. That's what sacrifice means. It costs you something. When it's the right thing to do at the right time, we need to say it the right way with the right heart, no matter what, after those conditions are met. Father, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray that anyone here today that doesn't know you, Father, would would come to know you. You're so worth living for, God. We stray and we wonder and we we put the, the most minute thing as the main thing so often, God. Call us back to making the things that matter the most, Lord. Break our hearts to desire the things that matter most, God. God, make us courageous but not courageous in hate, but courageous in love. Lord, make us courageous for you. You are love. Make us courageous for you, God. Give us hearts that truly want to to glorify you with our lives. Lord, I just thank you for Jesus today. I pray all these things in his name. Amen.